thanks to everybody and Bill especially and all the sponsoring organizations for inviting me. Um, in the last talk, Annie Laurie talked about the separation of church and state, and my brief is to talk about the separation of church and science, since I don't know much about government. The title of my talk, like you can see, is Faith is Not a Virtue, which is, um, it's going to be about the incompatibility of science and religion. But by religion, I really mean faith, because faith, although it's pervasive throughout the world of pseudoscience and UFOs, Bigfoot, and everything. And religion is the most invidious and pernicious and widespread instantiation of faith. So what I'm really attacking, although I'm attacking the incompatibility of science and religion, it's really the incompatibility of science with any sort of faith-based system or worldview. So if you follow almost anything, if you haven't been in Mongolia, you'll realize that the uh, interest in science and religion, I, I don't know, is, can everybody see the slides? Okay, so the interest in, in the relationship between science and religion is growing very drastically over the last four decades. And it, just to document that, I use the WorldCat, which is this computer literature scan, to look at the number of books that have been published on religion in a given decade, that's the denominator, and divide that, um, into the number of books, of number of those books that deal with science. So it's, this is the proportion of all religious books that also deal with science, i.e. the number of books that deal with science and religion together. And it's plotted by decade for the last four decades, and you can see that the number has been growing. It, it looks exponential, but actually it's doubled. So it's only 1%, but it's gone to about 2.5%. That's a huge statistical increase. So interest in the relationship of science and religion which you'll know if you read HuffPo or any of the books or articles um, by either theologians or scientists, is the relationship is growing. And if you look at most of those books, in fact, the vast majority of them, which line the library shelves, they're books that espouse accommodationism, that is the view that science and religion are compatible, friendly, amicable. In some cases, can, they can even help each other achieve a greater understanding of the universe, mutually reinforcing. And my thesis is that this is um, bullshit, um, and, yeah, I mean, I love the adulation you get in a secular crowd, but I'd, actually, in truth, I'd rather give this lecture in Alabama, which is where they really need it. Um, so what I'm going to do is tell you, um, first of all, my definition of what science is and what religion is and what incompatibility is, after I lay out why there is a problem, and then I'll tell you why I think they're incompatible, what my definition of incompatibility is. Um, how religion tries to fight back and make them compatible, and then in the last part of the talk, why do we even care about this problem? Okay. Start my stopwatch so I don't go over time. Accommodationism is rife in the United States in both the scientific and theological communities. Here's what's uh, arguably, or who is arguably the most important scientist in the United States. That's Francis Collins, head of the National Institutes of Health. He's an evangelical Christian, and he founded this organization called BioLogos, which is sponsored by the Templeton Foundation, which attempts to convert evangelical Christians over to accepting evolution. It hasn't worked. But it shows that, that a very important scientist is engaged in trying to reconcile science and religion. And in fact, this happens on the uh, official scientific organizations as well. They regularly issue statements showing that what we do as scientists is not incompatible with religion. Here's a statement, whoops, sorry, um, by the most, um, I'm sorry, I think I can go back. Um, by the, most widespread association of scientists in the United States, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Science and religion have fundamentally different questions about the world. Many religious leaders have affirmed that they see no conflict between evolution, between yeah, evolution in particular and religion. Of course, a lot of religious leaders have <laughs> do see a conflict between that. But this is an official statement by the organization saying that we don't have a problem with evolution or with science. The National Academy of Science, the most elite body of scientists in the United States, has a similar statement. Because they are not part of nature, supernatural entities cannot be investigated by science. Well, that's just crap. I mean, any study, I mean, if you think of it, and this is a line of many scientific organizations, 
any study of intercessory prayer is a scientific study of the supernatural. But anyway, they make these statements because we get our grant money from the public who's religious, and we have to make these motions, even though this organization is 93% atheist, although Hammett might take issue with that, you see now their attempt to reconcile science and religion coming from an organization which is predominantly secular. A lot of this stuff, including the AAAS initiative and the BioLotus initiative, are funded by the John Templeton Foundation. John Templeton, of course, you may know as a mutual fund billionaire who decided to dedicate his fortune to answering the big questions of human purpose and reality. And that plays out by trying to blur science and religion, by giving grants to religion-friendly scientists to investigate spirituality, to put on festivals where priests talk to scientists and kiss each other and things like that. And they have a huge amount of money to do this. The Templeton Foundation has $1.5 billion in endowment and annually spends about $70 million on this endeavor to blur the boundaries between science and religion. That's five times the National Science Foundation annual budget for evolutionary biology. So why do we worry about the compatibility of science and religion if, as the scientific organizations aver, they're really independent, they have nothing to do with each other? Why are we even having all this kerfuffle about trying to reconcile them? Well, first of all, it's because they're not independent of each other. Both science and religion, and this is my thesis, make statements about the way the universe is epistemic statements, statements about the way things are, and I'll document this with statements from theologians later. And second of all, people really know that science and religion are not compatible in their hearts, and I'll show some polling data that substantiates that in a minute. Okay, so if science and religion really are independent, as these scientific organizations and many liberal religious organizations declare, why do we have these things happening? First of all, widespread opposition to evolution, which is all coming from religion. I've only met one non-religious creationist in my life, and I have suspicions about him. Um, <laughs> Why do we have these organizations like BioLogos that fervently try to harmonize science and faith? If they're already harmonized, why are people spending so much money doing it? There's so many books coming out trying to harmonize science and faith in response to the new atheist books, the big four of them, you'll know, and many more of them are coming out. And there's a conflict between science and religion seen by many Americans. I'll show you the data on that in a second. And finally, a high rate of atheism among scientists. Now, if there's no conflict between science and religion, why are scientists so high in their proportion of non-belief? This is the proportion of non-belief. I don't have all the data for this, but I can give you the polls if you email me. Um, seven to 16 percent of the American public are agnostic or atheists. There's a high, slightly higher percentage of the nuns, as Annie Laurie told you, that don't identify with the religion. But if you look at American scientists, just all of them, whether they're good, bad, or whatever, 42% of them are atheists. So it's like six to seven-fold higher proportion of non-believers among scientists. If you go up the ladder of professional accomplishment, scientists at elite American universities, and this survey was taken by a religion-friendly scholar, um, Elaine Eklund, 72% of elite scientists, or scientists at elite universities are agnostics or atheists. And if you go up to the highest rung, the National Academy of Sciences, 93% of them are agnostic or atheists. Only 7% of them believe in a personal God. Now, Hemant said that these, these statistics are questionable. They well may be, but this was an anonymous poll. So there's no reason really to hide your religious belief. And even if only 50% of the people that didn't answer were atheists, that would still make this number 78%. So what, no matter which way you look at, there's a huge difference in the degree of belief between scientists and um, the regular American public. And you can ask yourself why that is. We can talk about it at the end if you want, but the obvious reason is that science and religion are incompatible. And if you do science for a living, you come to let slip any belief that you had when you were younger. Here's a, a survey of the American public asking people, um, are science and religion often in conflict? And you can see the data here. The general public, 55% of them say, yes, they are. So this is how the American public perceives the relationship between science and religion, despite their assurances by scientific organizations that it ain't so. Curiously, if you ask Americans, was well, your religion in conflict with science? Only 36% of them see it. 
So somebody, you know, it's always the other guy that's, that's having the problems and not you. But anyway, I'm, what I'm just doing here is just instantiating or documenting the degree of conflict, and the, the problem that does exist in U.S. life. Now, this is all United States data. I have very little information on Canada. And um, so this is sort of a USO-centric talk, and you'll have to forgive me for that. So I'm not sure the data of this kind actually exist for Canada. This is the thing which really bothers me. The, the most um, graphic example of the contradiction between religion and science. This comes from a Time Magazine Roper poll, and believe me, I did what Hemant said you should do. I wrote emails and actually got the data from the guy that conducted this poll, so I've seen the results. They asked a random sample of Americans, if science found a fact that contradicted the tenets of your faith, what would you do? You got three choices. Give up the tenet of your faith and accept the scientific fact. Evolution is a good example of one of these because it contradicts a lot of religious tenets, or give up the scientific fact, that is, reject the science and accept the tenet of your belief, or don't do anything, or I'm confused. I, uh, I, okay, so I'll ask you, um, since most of you are Canadian, what percentage of U.S. Americans would reject the scientific fact in, in order to keep the tenet of their faith? Oh, it's higher than that. Come on. You don't know you're Americans. So if I ask this question in the U.S., people, people will say 80%. Uh, well, it's not quite 80%, but it's 64%. In other words, two out of three Americans, roughly, would, if faced with a scientific, an intellectual scientific fact that contradicted their faith, would reject that and accept the tenet of their faith. Now, if this doesn't show a conflict between science and religion, I don't know what does. Okay? And this conflict is exemplified most strongly by American, and by American I mean U.S. I know I get, I, there's no word for U.S. that distinguishes it from Canadians. So, is there a word for this? United Stadians? Or, <laughs> <laughs> well, when I say Americans, I mean U.S. Americans, okay? Um, surveys of Americans' beliefs or acceptance of human evolution show that 46% of us are young Earth creationists. That is, they believe that humans were created within the last 10,000 years instantly. That's nearly one in two. 32% of Americans are, accept evolution, but they accept a theistic form of evolution. That is, it is guided by God in certain directions. Naturally, it's guided by God towards Homo sapiens. And finally, 15%, or roughly between one in six and one in seven Americans, accept the truth, which is that evolution is scientifically unguided naturalistic, materialistic process, okay? This is a conflict between science and religion because all of this opposition and this theistic evolution canard comes from religion. It is a shame, it is embarrassing to me as a United States American to say that the acceptance of angels in my country, and I'm not just talking as metaphorical angels, these are literal winged beings, is accepted by 63% of Americans, whereas acceptance of evolution, if you're generous, is 47% or 15%. Angels, hell, heaven, it all runs about 63 to 70% in the US. Darwin, in the scientific view, about 15%. This is, this is shameful, okay? And it's not just the US. We see this conflict between uh, in other countries as well. What I've done here is taken 32 European countries and plotted for each country, which is represented by a dot. Its belief in God is represented by, I think it's how often you pray every day. There's various um, criteria of religiosity versus acceptance of evolution. You can see there's this negative relationship. That is, the countries in which there's higher belief in God show a lower acceptance of evolution. Okay. Where's the United States on this, Paul? We're second to lowest. That's Turkey right there, which is a Muslim country. We have a very high belief in God. So you can see that there's a negative relationship between how much Darwin you accept and how much you believe in God. Now, you can argue about correlation and causation. In fact, I think there's an unspoken third factor here, which is societal dysfunctionality. But if, if you, it's true. The mo these are the most dysfunctional societies in the world. And believe me, the U.S. is dysfunctional on any sociological scale. Um, you have to give up 40% of your belief in God to get another 10% acceptance of Darwin. So it's an, it's an inflexible Darwin demand curve here. But again, it, uh, and what's going on here, I think, at least for these two variables, is that acceptance of God, or your learning about God, precedes your learning about Darwin. So once you've learned about God, it blinds you or makes you reject evolutionary biology. And I think that's a pretty good interpretation of everything. 
Okay. So why is this problem happening? Why do we see this conflict between religion and evolution? Um, it's because science is advancing and pushing religion further and further back in the corner. With every generation, new scientific advances come that dispel further vestiges of theism. We know now that evolution is true. I wrote a book on this. Um, we have cosmology. Larry Krauss, I don't know if he's here, wrote a book called The Universe from Nothing. By nothing, he means a quantum vacuum. And you know, even that disturbs a lot of theologians. Um, we can find, as, as one of the slides showed a few minutes ago, uh, I think, oh, it was the Carlos slide. Um, we can see evidences of morality or senses of fairness found in some of our closest relatives. Not necessarily we share those genes, but in small hunter-gatherer bands or uh, bands of, uh, of primates, we see them developing this sense of fairness. And that means that morality in humans could also have evolved, like it did in capuchin monkeys, and therefore it didn't have to come from God, which is one of the strongest assertions of religious people. Free will is an illusion. Um, so, or so, <laughs> the color and I maintain, and I think, I think uh, Dr. Krauss maintained, but I'm not quite sure about that. <laughs> Last night, um, certainly we don't. Very few rational people believe in libertarian free will, which is a bedrock belief of a lot of religious people. If you can't choose Jesus freely, what good is your religion? And finally, we have neuroscientific evidence. Sam Harris's new book will tell you this. It shows that there's very little evidence for a soul. Okay. But religious people don't want to be seen as being anti-science, at least the smarter ones and the more liberal ones. They're down with science in general. And so when these findings come and threaten their religion, the way they deal with it is to reconcile science and religion. So they're backed into a corner, so they make the assertion that science and religion really are compatible, no matter what science, no matter what science is telling them. People don't want to appear to be backwards about science. And a lot of this is reactions to these four Big atheist books, you know them as the, the, the sort of four horsemen, which make an assertion. I would claim that if there is one defining feature of new atheism, which is not explicit in this book, but it will be explicit in the book that I'm writing now, it is that religion and religious tenets are hypotheses. They are assertions about the way the universe is structured empirically. They are testable at least in principle by science, certainly by reason or observation. If you can't test them, then you should reject them. And so this sort of scientism or scienceism that runs through all of these books, most particularly in Richard Dawkins' book, is something that religious people just can't stand. They want to get their faith immunized against any kind of science whatsoever, even though we're beginning to show and make cogent arguments that indeed religion is not off limits to rational and empirical inquiry. Okay, and here's an example of the kind of thing that really pisses off theologians. This is a statement that Steve Weinberg made in Dreams of a Final Theory. The more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless. What he meant by pointless, and believe me, he's had to do a lot of explaining of this statement, is there's no point that comes down from a bearded old man in the sky to give meaning to the universe. That is, everything is explainable by materialistic, unguided natural laws. But even that kind of statement ticks off theologians. Here's John Hott, a Catholic theologian that I debated a couple of years ago. Religions can put up with all kinds of scientific ideas so long as they don't contradict the sense that the whole scheme of things is meaningful. What they cannot abide is the conviction that the universe and the life and life are pointless. So here we have a statement made by a Nobel laureate in physics that a, f a theologian says, we can't stand that, okay? They can't handle the truth is the problem. So I'll proceed now to my main argument. I have to define my terms. What do I mean by science? What do I mean by religion? What do I mean by them being incompatible? And to do this, I'll also tell you what I don't mean by them being incompatible. Science, well, you could construe science in any number of ways. You could say it's what I do when I go to work. It's what Larry Krauss does when he does to work, the profession of professional scientists. You could construe it as the body of knowledge that is produced by science, that is the knowledge, which is constantly, of course, changing. Um, you could construe it as the fruits of science, as technology. But I construe it, and I think that's the most sensible way, as something that doesn't really change. And that is, it's a methodology for finding out what's true about the universe. Most of you know how scientists work. We, there's a body of us. We check each other's results. The, in, the guiding 
um, feeling of a scientist is doubt and questioning. When you sit in a seminar by another scientist, you're always trying to think, what the hell is wrong with it? what he's saying? How can I show this person to be a moron? I mean, it, took me, it took me a long time to get used to that mindset, but then I realized that is the way the field moves forward, through doubt and questioning. And that's, of course, why we're all atheists. Um, it's conclusions change in results, the falsified hypothesis. We have to make predictions. We have to test those predictions. We have to test our theories against nature. And if nature doesn't support them, we have to throw them into the dustbin of good ideas that didn't pan out. Our truths are all provisional. I think sort of the best definition of science that has ever been put forward, or at least the rationale for doing science is by Richard Feynman, the physicist. The first principle is that you must not fool yourself, and you are the easiest person to fool. So you have to be very careful about that. In other words, science is a very elaborate and formalized schema of behavior and attitudes that prevent you from trying to say what is true, to trying to, to say what, you, what would like to be true is true. It's a way of preventing you from fooling yourself. Religion, of course, is exactly the opposite of that. It's a highly developed schema to make you think that what comforts you really is true. So that's a real dif difference in methodology between science and religion. What is religion? This is a sticky wicket by anybody's. I mean, how do you define religion when there are so many types of belief systems in the world? I'm just going to give one that corresponds to what most of us think of as religion, the Abrahamic religions. Um, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. This, I will fob this one off on Dan Dennett since it's his definition for breaking the spell, but I think it's as good as any. Social systems whose participants avow belief in a supernatural agent or agents whose approval is to be sought. Okay, I think it's, it's a theistic religion. And it comes with two other accoutrements. First of all, that you usually have a personal relationship with the deity if you're a worshiper of, of these kinds of religions. And second of all, and this is the dangerous part, it almost always comes with a code of conduct. That is, uh, the, the deity wants you to behave in a specific way, and you are to behave in this specific way. In other words, these kinds of religions come attached to a morality. Okay. And of course, you could, there are other things that are, you could call religion, like Buddhism. Is that a religion? Is Jainism a religion? I'm not only going to argue about that, because um, where this debate really goes on is in countries that have Abrahamic religions, okay? Religion is not based on empirical observation. It's not based on doubt. It's not based on inquiring your hypotheses against nature. It's based on dogma, authority, revelation, scripture, and faith, which I think was defined by Walter Kaufman, the best definition of faith, intense, usually confident belief that is not based on evidence that is sufficient to command assent from any, every reasonable person. Peter Brughassian would say it more curtly as believing, uh, pretending to believe what you know is not true or what you don't think is true. But faith is basically belief in the absence of substantial evidence, although some religious people will adduce weak evidence for their belief. Um, this is not just something I'm making up to this religion. It comes from the Bible. These are um, statements from Hebrews and John. The assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, and of course the Doubting Thomas parable, blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Doubting Thomas, who was actually being a scientist, wears those wounds, was dissed by Jesus because he was asking, asking for evidence, okay? So this is the religious definition of faith, okay? So it should be obvious to you that they're incompatible, but there's two arguments I wanted to spill before I get to my own argument for incompatibility um, that are the most common arguments for why religion and science are compatible. This one is the most common argument. It is that there are religious scientists in existence, and moreover, there are religious people who are science friendly. Now, doesn't that show that science and religion are compatible? Here's two of these. This is Francis Collins again, an evangelical Christian, and Ken Miller, who is um, a Catholic. He's been a very valuable ally in the fight against creationism, but he's a Catholic and he's written some accommodationist words. So this, does the fact that this guy's a Catholic and this guy's an evangelical Christian mean that science and religion are compatible? And my answer to that is no, it doesn't. It means that people can hold two incompatible worldviews in their head at the same time. If you hold this kind of way of accommodating science and religion, then you have to say that marriage and adultery are compatible because there's a lot of married people that sneak around on the side. Or if you want to make a more invidious comparison, you would say that 
Roman Catholicism and pedophilia are compatible because there's a lot because there's a lot of priests that are pedophiles and don't think really that there's anything wrong with it. So just holding two incompatible worldviews in your head, which is something that people do very nicely, does not mean that those worldviews are harmonious with each other. Okay. Another popular argument with the more intellectual segment of the accommodations community is one raised by Stephen Jay Gould, the non-overlapping magisteria argument as proposed in this book, Rocks of Ages, which was um, written in 1999. And this is basically Gould's tenet. Science tries to document the factual character of the natural world and the theories that coordinate and explain it. Religion, on the other hand, operates at the equally important, he didn't really mean that, but he said, <laughs> equally important but utterly different realm of human purposes, meanings, and values. In other words, there's two different areas of inquiry. Religion keeps its nose out of the natural world um, and deals with the real important questions of meaning, morality, and values. This is wrong in two respects. Mainly that religion can't keep its nose out of the natural world. Religious people are always making statements about the way the world is, including the existence of a deity who cares about us individually and has a code of conduct for it. Religion cannot stay out of the sphere of epistemic inquiry. And creationism is one example of those. Moreover, it's invidious to say that religion takes unto itself the questions of purposes, meanings, and values. If you know anything about Greek philosophy or secular philosophy, there's a long and honorable history of purposes, meanings, and values being dealt with by secularists, which, by the way, has yielded much more fruitful and humane results than inquiries um, by religious people. So Noma is just, um, it's a crock. And in fact, nobody accepts this anymore. And theologians don't like it because surprisingly, theologians will say, we're in the business of finding out the truth about the universe. Okay, and here's some statements by theologians. You don't have to go far to find them. I mean, I'm not cherry picking these. I could have given you 20 or 30 of them. Well, first of all, you can go in the Bible, which shows that Christianity depends absolutely on accepting that Christ came back to life again. If Christ be not risen, then it is our preaching vain and your faith is also in vain. That's from 1 Corinthians, from Paul. But you can find modern versions of this as well by John Polkinghorne, who used to be a physicist, um, philosopher of religion, Francis Collins and Carl Guyverson, re uh, religious physicist, religious scientist. Religion has anchorage of the way things actually are, the way they happen. Religion presupposes beliefs about the nature of reality and cannot be sustained if those beliefs are no longer credible. And finally, religion often makes claims about the way things are. So religion is more than just an emotional club. It's more than just a place where you go to commune and feel good with your fellows. It absolutely depends on accepting certain propositions about the cosmos. And this is regularly admitted by theologians. Okay. This, so religion actually is a form of science in that it makes statements which can be tested upon in some occasions about the way the world is. But in fact, as I'll try to convince you, it's a pseudoscience because these claims have been um, either proven to violate reason or violate empirical observation, and yet they're still defended by religious people in the same way that UFO believers defend UFOs and Bigfoot believers defend um, Bigfoot. Here's a very famous um, example of assertions about the real world made by scientists. This is the Nicene Creed. How many of you, are how many of you used to recite this? Okay, most people here are atheists, but uh, there's a, in the States, there would be a lot more hands that would do this. This is created as recited by both Catholics and Christians um, on Sunday mornings in church. It's a, a vow of what you really believe to be true. And what I've done is just gone through this and put in red every truth statement or every epistemic claim in the Nicene Creed. There is a God. He's part of a trinity, God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Um, he sent his son down who was born of a virgin, Mary, to... to um, suffer and die for humans. He was killed, but he was resurrected three days later, and he's gonna come back again and send us all to either heaven or hell, and you're gonna to go to hell unless you're baptized, amen. So everything in red here is a claim about the way the world is. Some of these are hard to test, but some of them at least you can test at least moderately, one of which is people can be born of virgins or people can come back to life after three days. I don't know how that why got such. So <laughs> I think Satan must be tooling with my. Anyway, so I've given you my definition of science. I've given you my definition of religion. I've tried to claim that both religion and science are competing with each other in the sphere of making claims about what is true in the universe. 
What is incompatible about science and religion? Well, I think there's incompatibility is far in three fronts. First of all, methodological. Second of all, philosophical. And third, in terms of outcomes. They reach different conclusions about the way the universe is. Methodological differences first, and I'll be very brief about this, because you already know that science is based, uses um, empirical observation, doubt, constant questioning of authority, inquiry of your hypotheses against nature, rejection of your hypotheses if nature does not conform to what they predict. In other words, in science, faith is a vice, in religion, faith is a virtue. No scientist in the world would be taken seriously if he said, I have faith that DNA is a double helix in 1950. And so therefore, it's true. I mean, immediately, you would have to examine that claim do x-ray crystallography, et cetera, et cetera. So there's this methodological incompatibility about how scientists find out what is true, provisionally true in the universe, and how religious people find out what is true, which is basically revelation, as um, William James has in his book, um, dogma, authority, and scripture. In science, there's ways, well-defined ways of knowing that you're wrong. I could stand up here and give you a list of 10 or 15 observations that, if made, would refute my own field of evolutionary biology. None of them have been made. Fossils in the wrong place would be one of them. But for every scientific acceptance of what is true, at least provisionally, there's a way to find out if it could be wrong, a way to prove it wrong. In religion, there's no way of knowing that you're wrong. How do you prove that God is not part of the Trinity? There's no way because the way that religion makes this claim is not based on rationality or anything that you can actually investigate with your senses. The philosophical incompatibility comes from a methodological difference, which is the use of naturalism and materialism. That is, after science used to use um, assumptions about the divine. I think I'm right about this, but when Newton couldn't figure out exactly why the planets kept in their orbits, he invoked the hand of God to keep them in their orbits. And so the divine used to be a valid kind of way of to do science. But over the years, and Kepler and other people have, have refuted this and found out that the orbits are stable without God, we've rejected the intervention of God time after time after time. And the greatest, of course, rejection of God was caused by Darwin, who showed that the evidence of design and nature could come from a materialistic process. Okay, so over the years, scientists have rejected this kind of materialistic approach, this, sorry, this kind of metaphysical approach to their field, um, which is called methodological naturalism. But if you do that over three centuries, and you never see any evidence of the divine, then it changes from a method to a philosophy, in other words, to philosophical naturalism. If you don't see God, and you should be seeing God, after years of scientific research, then you start saying, well, he's probably not there. And that's the philosophical difference between science and religion. We do not accept even the possibility now of God, although if there was evidence for God, we would back up and say maybe that's true. And finally, there's the outcomes. That is, the way the religious people, the truths that they have found or have claimed to have been found through revelation, through scripture, through dogma, have all been falsified by science here. Whoops, sorry, there's some of them. Um, Ex nihilo creation, Adam and Eve, the great flood, the efficacy of prayer, and the virgin birth and the resurrection. These are the fruits of the labors of religious people who have been trying to find out the truth about the world. And they're all wrong. So there's an incompatibility of outcomes. If the Bible really was inspired by God, either written directly by him or inspired through his human minions, why doesn't it say something like, hey, you know, why don't you wash your hands after you go to the bathroom? Or, you know, all the organisms on the planet got here by this process of slow change from other organisms that came about billions of years ago. There's nothing in scripture, either the Quran or the New Testament, that, that shows any knowledge of science beyond what was known about by the people who were alive when the Bible was written. So there's no evidence of any kind of divine pre-knowledge of science although there well could have been. And this shows you more than anything else that the Bible is a man-made document. It reflects the knowledge of the people who wrote it and not of any divine being who actually knew about evolution and germs and quantum mechanics and things like that. Okay. And of course, the truths that religion finds don't differ just between religion and science. They differ from one religion to another. So I can make the claim and write and do another lecture, not only that religion is incompatible with science, but that religion is incompatible with other religions that his religion is incompatible with itself. This is a phylogeny of religion. 
It's just like an evolutionary phylogeny, showing species branching off from one another. In this case, it shows, starting about 20,000 years ago, the different varieties of religion. I think Christianity's up here. Um, it's hard to read, and you don't really have to. Um, Confucianism and Hinduism are there somewhere. And Christianity, this is dramatically compressed. There's actually, this is, these are Christianity, there's actually 41,000 denominations of Christians. Now, if you look at this schism, each of these splits generally reflects a different, a, an argumentative claim about the way the world is. How many gods are there? Is there one or more? Is there a trinity? Do homosexuals go to hell? Is there a hell? Um, can women be priests? How many wives can you have? What's the moral code? Each of these splits represents a different claim about the way the universe is. And they're all incompatible with one another. Some less incompatible than others. But this shows that religions are they don't find truth, is what I'm trying to tell you, because each faith has its own set of truths. If you're a Christian scientist, you don't believe in the golden plates that the angel Moroni pointed out. If you're a Muslim, you don't believe that Jesus was the savior. In effect, you'll go to hell for that. Okay, there's thousands of different religions. There's only one brand of science. When I go to another country and talk about my work, it doesn't matter whether I'm in a Muslim country or a Catholic country, or a Lutheran country, it, we talk the same language. We agree on the same truths, it, by and large. The brand of science that we do and our working methodology and what we accept to be um, the received wisdom from science is the same. Okay, can religion reveal truth? I've asked the readers of my website several times, Tell me, this is sort of a mirror image of the question that Christopher Hitchens asked about morality, which many of you are familiar with. I've asked my readers to tell me, give me one example of a truth about the universe that was derived only from the methodology of religious intuition, dogma, or authority. And I have never had an answer to that, okay? Religion has no way of finding truth because there's no reliable methodology for finding out what's truth except what you like to believe in your own head. And as we know, this alone, without inquiring against nature or checking with other people, is not a reliable way to find out what's true. Over thousands of years of religious inquiry has not produced a single truth about the universe. I would claim that theology is no further advanced now than it was at the time of Thomas Aquinas. We don't even know if there's a God. We don't know how many gods there are. We don't know the nature of that God. As Dan Barker told me yesterday, theology has no subject to study. What theologians do is they study other theologians because there's, there's no way they can find truth about the thing they want to find truth about, which is God. So feel, and unlike science, the theological knowledge does not expand. It accretes into an ever larger growing ball of sort of twine or whatever. And as I said before, the religious truths are different, faiths are conflicting. Now, in response to this claim, the religious people have a common claim, but the Bible isn't a textbook of science. It's not meant to tell you the truths about science. Well, let's construe science broadly as what's true about the universe. And when I read this claim, it always translates in my mind to one thing, the Bible is not true. If the Bible's not a textbook of science, what is it a textbook of? Is it a textbook of metaphorical moral truths? Well, those don't exist in any objective form. Um, and in fact, every religious person, except for the hyper-liberal ones like Bishop Spong, do believe that the Bible is a textbook of science about something. This is a statement that I like to quote because I made it up myself and I don't make up many aphorisms. Some believers are fundamentalists about nearly everything, but nearly all believers are fundamentalists about something. And of course, for Christians, the sine qua non, the non-negotiable truth is the divinity of Jesus and his resurrection to save us from sin. That's in the Bible, and in that sense, the Bible is the textbook of science. But again, religious people, while they make epistemic claims, don't behave like scientists when those claims are challenged. When a claim of science is falsified, like the claim of cold fusion or the faster-than-light neutrinos, it is discarded. People say, it's a good idea, but it didn't work out. It's a pity. When a claim of religion is falsified, and I'll give you a few of those in a minute, it becomes a metaphor. <laughs> they will not give up their religious claims. If, it does, if it's not literally true, if science shows it to be wrong, then they say, well, it wasn't meant to be literally true. It was meant to be a metaphor. But of course, well, let's see if we can go back. Um, 
if you take, then that leads you into the problem of, well, which parts of the Bible are metaphor and which parts are true, and how do you know the difference between the two? How do you tell the wheat from the chaff? There's no way that has come up with an algorithm in order to distinguish that. So that's one of the problems of methodology between science and religion. How can you weed out the real truth claims, like Jesus is divine and was resurrected, from the metaphorical claims, some of which I'll mention before? Um, I'm not gonna go through these here, I just wanna, use these because I'll go through them one by one very briefly to show you that religion is a pseudoscience. It makes claims about the way the world really is, but when it's challenged, it has a number of devious strategies it uses to immunize itself against disconfirmation. The first one is the metaphorical card. The Bible doesn't really say what it seems to say. One of the great examples that's going on right now is the story of Adam and Eve, which is actually fundamental for Christianity because there actions created the original sin, which was inherited by all of their descendants because these were the two literal parents of humanity. And that original sin is what Jesus came back to expiate. And it's his, his crucifixion and resurrection that, um, that frees humans from the burdens of having to go to hell. The problem with this claim, which is, by the way, accepted as literal by the Roman Catholic Church, if you look at their official dogma, the popes have affirmed repeatedly that all humanity descends from two individuals, Adam and Eve, so much for the Catholic Church being down with science. It's not, but it also believes in demons and spiritual inhibition, and also that God gave humans a soul as opposed to all their animals. We now know from population genetics, which is my field, where you can back calculate from the degree of genetic variation in the human species, that the minimum population size of our lineage over the last couple hundred thousand years was 12,000 250, and that's a conservative estimate. And you do that by looking at how genetically variable the human species is today, what the mutation rates are, how low a bottleneck could that population have gone through to give us the variation we see today. And the estimate is 12,250. 10,000 in Africa, 2,250 roughly left Africa 60,000 years ago. So science has absolutely falsified this Adam and Eve claim. This has caused a lot of consternation amongst theologians, who, especially amongst Catholics, because the, their dogma is that these people really were the ancestors of all humanities. Science tells us it just ain't so. And they're working themselves up into a frenzy about this. <laughs> because one is to say, well, the Adam and Eve were just metaphors for something else. Like maybe, you know, humans evolved to be selfish. Although that's a pretty bad thing for Jesus to die for, our, our evolutionary heritage. I mean, what does that expiate? Um, but if you make the claim that Adam and Eve are metaphorical, then you're bound to say that Jesus died for a metaphor. And this is why Adam and Eve is such a live issue amongst even liberal theologians today. Who, and it's almost humorous if, that these people are getting paid to try to resolve this question by saying, well, maybe there was a thousands of people, but two of them were the titular heads of humanity, Adam and Eve, and the rest of them were not designated by God. I mean, there's 50 or 60 different solutions to this. But you can see that this is special pleading. It's what scientists wouldn't do. A scientist would say, well, obviously the story is wrong. It's wrong, it's made up. But religious people can't let go of it. They either make it into a metaphor or they engage in argument. Second of all, rationalize the things you already believe. As I showed from the Feynman quote, science's job is to prevent yourself from believing what you want to be true. Your job is to find out what is true. It's the opposite for the theologians. Here's John Hott again, trying to convince people that although there's no evidence for the afterlife, there really is one anyway. Um, and this is what he says. If he was to try to look for science evidence, scientific evidence for immortality, he would just be capitulating to the narrow empiricism that underlies naturalistic belief. This is what I call the argument from the treasure of Sierra Madre. You, remember, you might remember the line from them. I don't need to show you no stinking badges. This is, I don't need to show you no stinking evidence. In other words, Hot says, forget the evidence for heaven. That's stupid to even ask for it. That's a narrow empiricism. Although this is a matter of the greatest import to all of us, whether or not we're gonna live on after we die. What he does say is, the hope for some form of subjective survival is a favorable disposition for nurturing trust and the desire to know. Now, if somebody can explain to me what that means, I would be glad to hear that. This is theobabble. Um, the best I can make it out to be is, heaven is for real because I want it to be real. And that reiterates what's in the Bible. 
the assurance of things hoped for. That's the way theology works. It tells you that what is true is what you want to be true. And um, you make stuff up. When you're forced into a corner, you simply make up an answer and you stick with it. This is John Polkinghorne. Now, we don't see many miracles these days. There's not much evidence for God, although there was 2,000 years ago. Why don't we see evidence for God? And this is a question that occupies theologians. And there's lots of answers, and they're very humorous, but I'll just give you one by John Polkinghorne, who used to be a physicist and then became an Anglican priest um, in a book published recently. The presence of God is veiled because when you think about it, the naked presence of divinity would overwhelm finite beings, depriving them of truly being themselves and freely accepting God. This is what I call the argument from Jack Nicholson, which is, <laughs> you can't handle God. <laughs> and that's why, that's why you don't see him. Okay. The problem with this explanation is it fails to consider an alternative scientific hypothesis, which is one raised by the Alabama philosopher Dallas McCown, the invisible and the non-existent look very much alike. <laughs> I mean, it was, it would, I mean, religious people hate this because this is really an alternative scientific hypothesis for the fact that we don't see much evidence for divinity in the world today, okay? Uh, rationalizing every observation that, that doesn't comport with your philosophy is another favorite theological trick. It's exactly the opposite of what scientists do. If we find something that goes against one of our theories, we investigate it like dogs after sniffing after a rat. Um, but theologians will simply make up reasons why what looks to be a problem for their theology is really a benefit. Evolution is one of those. It's the greatest God killer that ever came down the pike because it killed the most powerful argument for religion that was ever made. There was no alternative explanation for the marvelous design or designoid features, as Richard calls them, of animals and plants. Now Darwin comes along and explains the whole thing as a materialistic process. What do religious people do? Instead of giving up their faith, which tells them that God created everything out of nowhere, they turn it into a virtue. A world of evolution is actually much more exciting. This is what I call the, the argument from V8, which is, God, why didn't we see this in the first place? You know? <laughs> Isn't it a tribute to God that the world is not just paths of putty in the Creator's hands, but instead an inherently active and self-creative process, one that can evolve and produce new life on its own? From John Hodd again, Francisco Ayala is in the National Academy of Sciences. This is what's known in my trade as special pleading. Um, it's a rationalization. It immunizes religion against any observation that makes it look bad. Okay. And in fact, uh, this whole rationalization process is what I call the, the theological sausage grinder. And when I looked up sausage grinder on um, Google to try to find a picture of one, the first one that came up was this one, which was labeled TSM, which fortuitously was theological sausage machine. <laughs> so I, the way I interpret it, and this is what they do with evolution. They take something which is a scientific necessity. You have to believe in it if you're a scientist because the evidence is in its favor. You put it through the machine of apologetics and it comes out as a theological virtue at the end. So that there is nothing that science can find that some clever theologian who gets paid a lot of money and drinks sherry at the end of the day cannot convert into something that really makes their religion stronger at the end. It's a disconfirmation strategy. Okay, I'll just skip this one because it's not really that relevant. Um, different faiths give different answers to different questions. This is a list of the big questions. It's proposed by John Hott. Remember, Steve Gould says that religion deals with the big questions of meaning, purpose, and values that science can't handle. So here's some of those big questions. How should we live? Does God exist? Why does anything exist at all? Well, maybe Larry could answer this question. Um, why is there so much suffering? Why do we die, et cetera? Um, none of these questions have been answered by religion. What they do is address these questions. And when you see a question addressed, then you know that that question has not been answered. That's the big one. Why is there so much suffering? This is the, what I consider the Achilles heel of religion these days, theodicy. The explanation of unwarranted suffering by innocents like children getting cancer and tsunamis killing thousands of people. Ask some religious person how a benevolent, omnipotent, omniscient God can allow this to happen, and then just stand back and watch the fun. And even Hot admits that they can't answer this question. The transience and expected death of the cosmos defies our attempt to state clearly what the point of it 
must be. Remember, this is the same guy that said they can't stand, he can't stand the view of the universe is pointless. But when asked for what the point is, he says, well, we don't know. <laughs> I mean, you could say, well, maybe there isn't a point as well. Okay, and then religion fights back with accusations against science. I'm not gonna go through these, but religion has a number of defensive strategies that they raise when they're pushed into a corner by science. Science can't prove that God doesn't exist. The, the you can't prove a negative strategy, which is wrong, because you can prove a negative. More about that maybe later. Science fosters scientism, the view that science is the only reliable guide to truth. I would claim that this is correct if you conceive as truth as objective truths about the cosmos. Science gives us no moral grounding, true, but neither does religion, or at least what, more, what moral grounding it gives us is bad. And then the two quark arguments, two, two quark arguments, science is a faith-like religion. This is really a bad canard because it's not. We test our theories, we don't take them on faith and science has been misused. And it's very curious that religion of all disciplines would raise these two issues, saying, well, see, you're just as bad as us. That's their defense against the incursions of science. Okay, so I'm running out of time, so there's, um, you can't prove a negative, you can prove a negative, because if the evidence should be there under a proposition, but it is not, then you become increasingly confident that that whatever is supposed to cause that evidence to appear does not exist. This is the reason why nobody in this room is gonna say, I believe in the Loch Ness Monster. Because if there was a Loch Ness Monster, we would have had this, all these sonar scans and submarines sent down to the loch, find some, you know, plesiosaur from the Jurassic, and it hasn't found nothing. Is anybody in here? I think of, uh, nobody's going <laughs> nobody dares raise their hand, but, but that's proving a negative. You, say, you can say with fair confidence that the log mass monster would, does not exist. And by the same token, I'd say we can say with fair confidence that God does not exist because we have, if God existed, there would be evidence in favor of him. We see no evidence of divinities or miracles. Um, and so that's evidence for absence. Evidence against intercessory prayer. There's been five or six studies now of this and all of them have come up negative. It's faith healing or intercessory prayer. Um, amputees don't grow their limbs back. This is a famous atheist trope. God can heal leukemia, but of course le leukemia can go into spontaneous remission. We've never seen a limb grow back, and sure enough, God can't make one grow back either. Um, previous evidence for divinity has been dispelled. We see this unjustifiable suffering, which absolutely does not comport with the Abrahamic God and cannot be explained except by the devious and clever minds of well-paid theologians. And finally, the earth is gonna to be toast in 2.3 billion years. How does that fit into God's plan? I'm sure a theologian can answer that question. Um, almost near the end now. So what about these calls of dialogue between science and faith? You hear them all the time. Let's talk to each other and hash out the issues. Here's a cartoon I found when I Googled that because we got, we're gonna work hand in hand together and together we can each set a complimentary set of truths about the evidence. My view is that we cannot have a constructive dialogue between science and religion. What we can have is a destructive monologue with science doing all the talking. Can science contribute to faith? Yes, it can. It can disprove its claims about the world. And in theory, we could prove its claims about the world. If those experiments on intercessory prayer had worked, then we might say, well, maybe there's something out there that we don't really understand. But science really can make a contribution to religion by, showing, by testing its claims and either showing they're right or wrong. They've all been shown to be wrong. Can faith contribute to science? No, because there's nothing that scientists can use or take that will come from religion. As Laplace said, we have no need of that hypothesis. Okay, the last bit, why do I care? Why am I talking about the, um, the comporting of science with religion? If religion was purely a personal matter, if people had all these crazy beliefs and did not impose them on other people, and I agree absolutely with Annie Laurie that imposing them on children is, is heinous, it's insupportable. But if people just had these crazy beliefs and kept them to themselves, I would not be standing up here talking to you. I just see it as a form of UFOlogy or Bigfootology or Loch Ness Monsterology. But they cannot do that because um, religion is rarely a personal matter. Annie Laurie, I think, documented very well how people not only have these beliefs, but they try to impose them on everybody else that does not share those beliefs, especially on the children. Religion is a package of assertions which almost guarantees that you have to impose on other people because first of all, it claims that it has a handle on the absolute truth without any good evidence to support that truth. Second of all, it comes with a system of morality. 
God tells you what's right or wrong. And third of all, you get eternal reward or punishment if you adhere to that. Given this toxic mixture of assertions, you almost have to impose your beliefs or at least tell your beliefs or spread the good news amongst other people. It's a sacred duty to missionize. If one accepts that one has the, this is from Rodney Stark, who's a Christian um, sociologist of religion. If you have the good fortune to be in possession of the one true religion, of course, it's unspoken that it's Christianity for Dr. Stark, and has access to the most valuable possible rewards, is one not obligated to spread this blessing to less fortunate? And his answer, of course, is yes. He compares this to having a vaccine that cures a disease that's devastating a South American tribe that's wary of needles. But we have a duty to give them that vaccine because it's going to cure them. And he thinks we have a duty to spread the good news about Jesus because it's going to save us. It's going to save us from eternal burning. We have um, the mixing up of faith with the use of evidence the way science does is blurs the distinction between having good reasons for what you believe and bad reasons for what you believe. We must not encourage people to have faith. Faith is a vice. It is the belief in something that has very little evidence or no evidence or even counter evidence to, um, to support it. And we should not, especially not impose that on children who are innocent kids who we have no right to propagandize with these kinds of lies. And because this pro propagandization has inv invidious results. This is what happens when you teach children lies about their belief. This is Jehovah's Witnesses. Do you, do you all know that Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe in blood transfusions, right? That's a, dog, that's a tenet of their faith that comes from two verses in the Bible that you shouldn't eat blood. Um, and so the Jehovah's Witnesses usually do not have blood transfusions. My own doctor tells me he's watched them die when he could have saved them by giving them blood. But they won't do that. They'd rather die. What they do, however, is inculcate their children with the same philosophy, thereby making them martyrs to their parents' faith. This is a copy of the Watchtower, sorry, Awake, which is the Jehovah's Witness magazine. This is from 1994, but it's still going on. Every child that's pictured on this page died because he or she refused the blood transfusion, because their parents told them that it was better to do that. These kids voluntarily said, I don't want to have a transfusion because God doesn't want me to. They all died. Look what they're called. Youths who put, God's for, who put God first. This is insane. It's barbaric. It's reprehensible. And it's not just the Jehovah's Witnesses that do this. Christian scientists do this too. Thousands of children, and Pentecostals as well, have died because they don't believe in Western medicine because they rely on God to heal them. This is pervasive in the United States. Um, I, don't know, I don't know if this is true in Canada, but this is something that shocked me when I find out, that virtually every state has a religious exemption for withholding medical care from your child. So if you have a diabetic son and you're religious and you don't want to give that kid insulin and the kid dies, if you're not religious, you are guilty of child neglect, child abuse, sometimes um, felonies. If you're religious, you get off scot-free because there's religious exemptions. Religious exemptions for... Um, Child abuse, the neglect, felony crimes, immunization. You don't have to immunize your child if you have a religious excuse. You don't have to have them tested for metabolic diseases, blood, lead poisoning. This is the craziest one. Um, two states have religious exemptions for wearing bicycle helmets. I suspect that one of those is the Amish, but I'm not sure about that. And California allows public school teachers to review t tuberculosis testing on religious grounds. This is unconscionable. It leads to the deaths of thousands of children. And I can give you books that document this. What does this mean? First of all, the incompatibility between science and religion. Because Western science could save these kids. But we allow them to die without convicting their children. Second of all, we are all complicit. That is, United States citizens are complicit. Because these are our laws made by our government. I mean, think of, consider, compared to giving religious ministers a housing allowance that's tax-free, what about allowing you to kill your kid based on your faith? That's much, much worse as far as I can see. And second of all, it's not just the fundamentalist Bible thumpers that do this. Christian scientists are, are rich, well-off people. And the rest of us support this. You don't see people... I mean, I would urge the FFRF to do something about this if you could do something about it. <laughs> because this actually leads to the deaths of individual human beings. If you say, well, this doesn't happen all that often, think about the Catholic Church. 
all the perfidies that they perpetrate in the name of a misguided faith, which is supposedly based on evidence, opposition to birth control, opposition to abortion, divorce, homosexuality, control of people's sex lives, oppression of women, sexual abuse of children, installation of fear and guilt in children. I would claim that if there were not religion that was based on fact claims, we would have none of this. None of this could arise, I think, in a rational, secular world. So this is directly, this is what happens when you confuse faith with rationality. Okay, so at the end, I'll just close with a statement by Sam Harris, which I think sums it all up very well. Pretending to be certain when one isn't, indeed pretending to be certain about propositions for which no evidence is even conceivable, is both an intellectual and a moral failing. And the church is repeatedly guilty of this failing throughout its history. Martin Luther, for example, is famous for his statements against reason. Reason must be deluded, blinded, and destroyed. And unless you think that Pope Francis is an improvement over Martin Luther, previous popes, here's a statement he made just recently. The spirit of curiosity is not a good spirit. He's trying to discourage you from asking too many questions about the Catholic faith. So that's all I have to say. I've run out of time. Thank you.